So here we are at the last section of chapter 14. This one might get a little bit long. May end up splitting videos. Um, we talk about curvature and normal vectors. I'm going to let you read through the PowerPoint and see how these formulas are derived. Curvature basically tells me how much a curve changes. So if I can find the length of a curve, that's great. But how does the curve change? Does it change a lot? Is this curvature constant as it goes around? Or does it curve more or less as it goes through? And there are pictures and illustrations. I work my way in the PowerPoint all the way through until I get to this formula. That little guy that I underlined there, that's a kappa. It's a Greek letter. I'm going to oftentimes just write it as a simple K, but it's technically not a K, it's a kappa. So suppose I want to find the curvature for this thing in two dimensions. What is it? It's basically a three unit circle. If cosine T sine T is the unit circle, then three cosine T three sine T is the three unit circle. So I've got to work my way through to find the tangent vector. And then from there, find the derivative and divide it by the magnitude of R. So let's start with R prime. If I know what R is, I can find R prime. R prime of T is going to be three times the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So I get negative three sine T. Then the derivative of sine is cosine. So I get three cosine T. All right. So that's R prime. If I want the magnitude of R prime, this shouldn't surprise you because we already know it's a three unit circle, but let's go through the process of doing it. Negative three sine T. If I square it, I'll get nine sine squared T. If I square three cosine T, I'll get nine cosine squared T. And that will give me the square root of nine, which is three. All right. So then what is the unit tangent vector? The unit tangent vector is going to be R prime divided by the magnitude of R prime. So R prime is, no, it's R prime. Here we go. <laughs> it's going to be negative three sine T divided by three. The second component will be three cosine T divided by three. Okay. And it's a vector. So what do I get? I get negative sine T cosine T. That is my T. Now the formula needs T prime. So T prime is just the derivative of what I have. So since this is relatively simple, I'll just write it up here. The derivative is going to be the, the derivative of sine is cosine. So I get negative cosine T, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And now the magnitude of this is just going to be one because sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. The magnitude is one. I right, have about the magnitude of R prime. We already know what it is. It's three. So that kappa value is going to be one over three. It's constant. So what does this mean? That means that the curvature of a circle is constant. As you take that circle and go all the way around, it curves the same amount everywhere. Now, my drawing, maybe it doesn't perfectly curve around the same all the way around, but in an actual circle, it curves around the same as you go all the way through. All right, so that's what curvature is. There are other ways to calculate curvature. And again, I'll let you run through the PowerPoint examples that I have. The idea is that I can start replacing some of these vectors with cross products and taking magnitudes of cross products and doing a little bit of substitution. And I end up with the formula that's down on the bottom over here. So instead of doing magnitudes of derivatives of unit tangent vectors, I can deal with everything in terms of velocity and acceleration. Another way you'll see this written is I'll replace the V's with an R prime and the A's with an R double prime, simply because that's what it is in terms of position, velocity, acceleration, you can replace those V's with R primes and those A's with R double primes. So let's try an example that uses that formula instead. In fact, let's use exactly the same example, but with this different formula. So we'll go back to that three unit circle that we had. I'm going to use Z equals zero because this is a three unit circle on the X, Y plane. There is no Z value. So is it possible to use this formula? Sure it is. R prime which is V is the same R prime as before, except now we're going to add a zero for the third position. So I get negative three sine T, three cosine T, zero. 
And then the acceleration vector is the derivative of that. So negative 3 cosine t. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so negative 3 sine t and 0. And then the magnitude of the velocity vector is just 3, right? We had figured out in the last example that if this is a 3-unit circle, the magnitude of that vector is just 3, right? It's always 3 units away from the center. All right, so how do I do V cross A? Let's come over on the side here and do V cross A. So remember, we set up that determinant. The i's, j's, and k's go across the top. I'm going to leave some space since now we have trig functions in here. The velocity we said was negative 3 sine t, 3 cosine t, 0. And the acceleration is going to be negative 3 cosine t, negative 3 sine t, 0. All right. So now separate them apart. I end up with my i's times the 2 by 2 determinant, but wait a minute, they're all zeros, right? I get 3 cosine times 0 and a negative 3 sine t times 0, so that's just i times 0. Minus j, but you notice what happens when you knock out row 1, column 2. You end up with these two terms here and those two terms there. Well, when you do those cross diagonals like this and that, they're both multiplied by 0, so that j comes out to also be 0 plus k. All right, so now here's what we got work to do. Negative 3 sine t times negative 3 sine t is going to be positive 9 sine squared t. And when I do it the other way, don't forget it's minus a negative 9 cosine squared t. So I end up with a k times 9 sine squared t plus 9 cosine squared t which is just 9, right? 9k. So v cross a is 9 in the k direction. But the formula actually calls for the magnitude of v cross a. Well, what is the magnitude of the vector 0, 0, 9? The magnitude is just 9. So the magnitude of v cross a is 9. So in my formula up here already, I can replace that numerator with a 9. How about the denominator? The denominator is the magnitude of v cubed. Well, the magnitude of v is 3, so I get 3 cubed, which is 27. So a 9 on the top, a 27 on the bottom. Simplify, and I get a third. So my curvature is exactly the same as we would expect it to be, right? It's the same three-unit circle, so why would the curvature change? It doesn't. The curvature is the third, no matter which formula I use. Which formula should I use? Does it matter? Either way, I come up with the same answer. Pick one you like. Okay. Eventually, one may become easier than the other, but for now, we'll leave that open. All right, can a curvature not be constant? So far, we've looked at the same example twice, and so the curvature of that circle was constant. How about this example? I've got a parabola that is r of t equals t and 3t squared. Find the curvature. So I already know what r is. How about my v? Take the derivative of t, and I get 1. Take the derivative of 3t squared, and I get 6t. I'm going to leave my third term as 0. And then what is the acceleration? The acceleration is 0, 6, 0. All right. I need a cross product to get the magnitude of v cross a. So first of all, the vector v cross a is going to be defined by i, j, k, 1, 6t, 0, 0, 6, 0. All right. When I set up my three pieces, I'll end up with an i times 6t, 0, 6, 0, minus j, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus k. And can you see where this one's heading again? 1, 6t, 0, 6. All right. This will come out to be 0, right? Cross it around, I'll get 0. So I'll get 0 in the i direction. Notice that 0 minus 0 is still 0, so 0 in the j direction. But in the k direction, 1 times 6 is 6, and then 6t times 0 is 0. All right, so 
v cross a over here is going to be the vector 0, 0, 6, which means that the magnitude of v cross a, I really should be putting vectors on top, is just 6. It's a vector that is perpendicular to the plane, 6 units in the k direction. All right, so what else do I need in order to finish this problem? The other thing that I need is I need the magnitude of v. Well, what's the magnitude of v? The magnitude of v is the square root of 1 squared plus 6t squared. Huh, well, the square root of, uh, the square of 6t is 36t squared. Now, all of a sudden, I've got a curvature that is not constant. Because when I set up my formula, my formula is what? My formula is that that curvature is the magnitude of the cross product, which is going to be 6, right? We got that in the previous step, over the magnitude of the velocity cubed. Well, here's the velocity, which I can represent as 1 plus 36t squared to the 1 half. When I cube that, I get 1 plus 36t squared to the 3 halves. That curvature is not constant. That's my answer, right? It's not a number in this case. So what do we find? Well, first of all, this thing is a parabola. And if you look at the PowerPoint, you'll see my parabola in there. As the t values get close to 0, that's when this thing has the greatest curvature, right? When t equals 0, the curvature here is 6. As those t values increase, in other words, positive and negative to the right and to the left of the center of that parabola, then that curvature begins to decrease. So it has the most curvature at the bottom of the parabola. As it starts going further and further up, the curvature is less and less. The rate of change is greater, right? The slope increases, but the curvature does not. All right, principal unit normal vectors. What is a principal unit normal vector? Principal unit normal vector gives us the direction of the curve. If the curvature gives us the bend, it tells us how much it changes without regard to the direction. The principal unit normal vector gives us the sort of bend in that curve. So the principal unit normal vector can be found. Did I put the formula up here? No, I did not. The principal unit normal vector formula looks like this. It is, and we use that for the principal unit normal vector, it's d capital T dt over the magnitude of dt, sorry, capital T. So you're going to have to first find the tangent vector, then find the derivative of the tangent vector, and then take that and divide it by its magnitude. It is true, by the way, that when you take the dot product of the tangent vector and the normal vector, you should get zero. All right, so let's try it with this helix over here. 4 sine t, 4 cosine t, 10 t. So the first thing is I want to find that tangent vector. So if I take the derivative, I'm going to end up with 4 cosine t. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so negative 4 sine t. The derivative of 10 t is 10. I'm going to take that over the magnitude of the vector that I just found. So when I do that, I'm going to end up with the square root of 16 cosine squared t plus 16 sine squared t plus 100. All right, well, that's not too bad. The number on the bottom is actually the square root of 116, right? These two things here will combine together to give me 16. 16 plus 100 is 116. So let's come over to the side here. And we'll write out what we have so far, which is 4 cosine t. That's my first component. Negative 4 sine t is my second component. 10 is my third component. And we said we're going to divide each of these by the square root of 116. Does that simplify? Sure, it does. The square root of 116 can be broken down into the square root of... 58. Nope, square root of 29. Square root of 29, square root of 4. 58 and 2 will not work. 29 and 4 will. So square root of 29, square root of 4. So I get 2 square root of 29. So let's divide each of these things by 2 square root of 29. All 
So now let's pull that square root of 29 out of the whole thing, actually. And so my tangent vector, the v over the magnitude of v, becomes 1 over the square root of 29 times 2 cosine t, negative 2 sine t, 5. All right, so that's the first step. Second step is to take the derivative of that and its magnitude. So the derivative of t with respect to t is going to be 1 over the square root of 29 times what? The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So I get negative 2 sine t. The derivative of sine is cosine, so I get negative 2 cosine t. And the derivative of 5 is 0. Now, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to divide it by its magnitude. When I do that, you realize that that 1 over the square root of 29 that's on the outside is going to become irrelevant. So when I go to find the magnitude of dt over dt, I'm going to actually ignore that 1 over the square root of 29 rather than introduce it and then divide it out. So I'm going to end up with the square root of 4 sine squared t plus 4 cosine squared t. And that will give me what? The square root of 4, which is 2. All right, so I'm almost done. My next step then is to take dt dt. And here, I'm going to be cheap, and I'm just going to get rid of that 1 over the square root of 29. And I'm going to divide it by 2 because the magnitude of that vector is 2. So I'm going to take dt dt and divide it by the magnitude. And I'm going to end up with a normal vector of negative sine t cosine t 0. All right. Now, I could take that and I could do a dot product of the tangent vector and the normal vector, right? Whatever my original tangent vector was, which is way up at the top. And now take that and, and do the dot product of that and the normal vector, you will end up with zero. And so you can verify that those two dot products are always zero. The only th other thing I'm going to point out, and then I'm going to start a new video for binormal vectors and torsion, is that when you deal with acceleration, if you're now dealing with acceleration in vector form, there's actually two different acceleration formulas. You have acceleration in the direction of the normal vector, and you have acceleration in the direction of the tangent vector. And you can separate those two components by looking at the curvature with respect to the velocity. So the acceleration in the direction of the normal vector is the cross product of the velocity and acceleration over the velocity. This didn't import my dot product. This second one over here, the acceleration in the direction of the tangent vector, should have a dot in between the two of those. That's what that box is there. So I'm taking the dot product of velocity and acceleration, dividing it by the magnitude of the velocity, and then you throw them up in the formula here. That a sub n and that a sub t become your coefficients. The n and the t are the vectors. And so you can separate it to see if all of the acceleration is going in one direction or if it's split between the normal vectors and the tangent vectors. So that's all for this one. We'll come back and we'll do the binormal vectors and the torsion next.